John Newton, the writer of the beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, was one of those who helped William Wilberforce achieve his life ambition. And Wilberforce's life ambition was to abolish slavery completely. 250 years ago, Wilberforce met Christ in a real powerful way. And he set his heart for the next 40 years to abolish a terrible thing called slavery. He was encouraged by well-known people like John Wesley. And he was really on fire for God, somebody said. Although he was a serious man, but he said, if this is madness, I hope we all catch it because he was so zealous for Christ and so zealous to change the world. And he did it through Parliament. He did it through influencing the Prime Minister and the members of Parliament in the British Parliament. And he battled against slavery to have it stopped. Now, in the USA, they tried to abolish slavery, but uh, three quarters of a million people died in the Great Civil War. But through the influence of Wilberforce in the United Kingdom, slavery was abolished without any blood being shed. Tremendous testimony. And just before Wilberforce died, in fact, 29th of July, when he died, three days before he had the message, slavery has been abolished throughout the, the world where Britain had influence. What about you? Do you have a life mission? Do you have a reason for living? Do you have something that wakes you up in the morning? Do you have something which governs your life? Well, Moses had a an ambition, a life ambition to bring the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And <clears throat> you read about it, particularly in the book of Exodus. Exodus has 40 chapters. It's a story of deliverance. It takes place about 17, 1700 years before Christ. And it goes on till about 1490 BC. The main people in the story are Moses and his brother Aaron. And the main theme is a wonderful theme. It's freedom. And the background to Exodus. Joseph had been sold as a slave into Egypt. It began with slavery. His brothers betrayed him. And he ended up in prison. But, you know, God brought him out of prison and raised him up to be the, the ruler next to the Pharaoh, the ruler in Egypt. And he set the people free. He fed the hungry. He did a remarkable work. And that's how the story begins. God used him to save the whole nation from starvation. But, you know, after a while, the old Pharaoh died and a new Pharaoh, a new king of Egypt came and he didn't know what Joseph had done. He didn't recognize it and they got worried. They thought there are too many Jewish people in Egypt. So they made them into slaves again. They made them so they would serve the Egyptians. Now, Moses is a wonderful picture of Christ. He was a picture of Christ in that he set his people free. He led them out of bondage into liberty. Throughout the Bible, you get great pictures of Christ. We talked about Joseph just before. Well, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. Jesus was rejected by his own people. He ended up in prison. He ended up even crucified. But just as Joseph was brought out of prison and became the ruler of Egypt, the one who fed the people and met their needs. So Jesus rose from the dead and he became the savior of the whole world. Isn't that wonderful? The tremendous pictures you'll find. And you could say it was a story of the pit to the palace, 
for old Joseph, but also Moses. He was saved from the bulrushes, saved from being murdered by the king of Egypt. He was set free. He grew up and God used him to be the one to take the people to freedom. The book of Exodus, it's all about exit. That's what Exodus means, exit. It means the way out. And somebody said this about Moses. For 40 years, he thought he was somebody who was brought up in Pharaoh's palace. He spent 40 years in the wilderness, learning he was a nobody. And then he learned 40 years leading the children of Israel to freedom that God can use a nobody and make him somebody. And I want to say to you that God can use you if you will unreservedly give yourself into the hands of God and say, here am I, use me, Lord. You'll find that God will take nobodies <laughs> and make them somebodies. Isn't that wonderful? So Moses died um, about uh, 1406 BC, before Christ. And he never entered the promised land. But you read later, when the Lord Jesus came, that he met with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's the first occasion we read about Moses being in the promised land. So it, it breaks down into three parts. From zero to 40, he had everything as a member of the royal family. Pharaoh's daughter cared for him. From 40 to 80, he was a shepherd in Midian, the land of Midian. And from 80 to 120, he was Israel's first great leader, gave them the law, led them to the promised land. And uh, it's a wonderful story. The exodus from Egypt took place about 1446 BC. And it's a great redemption story, great story of liberty and freedom. In Exodus, we learn about the Passover, the lamb was slain, but the people to be saved, the blood of the lamb meant salvation for the people. John the Baptist said about Jesus, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ died for our sins and he rose again to give us new life. Moses is a type of Christ. He leads people to the promised land. If we will follow him, he'll lead us into rest. He'll lead us into peace. He'll lead us into our inheritance. Pharaoh is like Satan, the slave owner. And God wants to break every kind of human bondage and slavery, every addiction, every sin. This is the great takeaway message of the book of Exodus. It's about freedom, deliverance and salvation. They're yours through the cross of Christ on the cross Christ cried out, it's finished. And he meant paid in full. Everything was done to save you, to forgive you, to give you new life, to release you. If you will believe it, you can enter in today to a totally new life. It's a wonderful thing to study Moses with Christ. He, he's a picture of Christ. Some other things. When you walk with the Lord in his good time, he brings you out of situations that pull you down to bring you into something better. Egypt meant slavery. The promised land meant freedom. They were led by a pillar of fire and a cloud guided the children of Israel step by step. And I want to say God will guide you. God guides his children. Usually it's just one step at a time. But if you put your life into his care and his keeping, he will lead you. Absolutely. You might only see one step ahead of you. But as you walk by faith, you'll see God will lead you. I retired from being a pastor and a missionary a few years ago and moved to a place called North Wales in the United Kingdom. And I had no plans except to retire. And take it easy but instead God had great plans giving me opportunities to 
rich people from all over the world. And uh, God moves in a mysterious way. There was a man called William Carey. He was one of the first great missionaries to go to the Indian subcontinent. And he said, I can plod. And what he meant was I can just take one step at a time. That's all you need to do. Keep walking day by day in faith, stepping out for God, just like Moses going through the wilderness, one step at a time. Follow what the Lord says. Follow where God leads you. Where he leads me, I will follow. Some big lessons to learn from the story of Exodus. Beware of grumbling. Beware of bad attitudes. These will destroy your life. They'll destroy your fellowship with God. God will use your circumstances to develop faith, character, strength and obedience. One fascinating thing happened in Exodus 11 verse 3. It says the people found favour in the sight of the Egyptians. When they were leaving Egypt, the Egyptians blessed them. It was interesting. When I was leaving my last place, I lived uh, in Greater Manchester in the United Kingdom. And our neighbours, they somehow we, we'd we won their friendship and they wanted to have a party for us. Isn't that wonderful? And it was a very difficult area. In fact, after we'd left, I believe somebody got murdered. But by God's grace, our neighbours warmed towards us. They wanted to bless us, give us a party. And I believe we can find favour with God if we will follow him, if we will please him. Go forward in faith. The Lord revealed himself to Moses and he said, I am that I am. The Lord Jesus said seven times in John's gospel, I am. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. If anybody doubts that Jesus was God, they need to read what God said to Moses. His name was I am. And what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. I am. When Thomas came to Jesus and said, unless I see, I won't believe. And Jesus said, put your hands in, feel the nail prints. And when he realized it really was Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't say, don't say that. Thomas, it's blasphemy, he said, because you've seen, you believe. Jesus is God come in the flesh. Most amazing thing. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The fire kept burning, never went out. It helps us understand God. Our God is a consuming fire, eternal, pure fire. Everything about God is pure. Oh, amen. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the, the gate. I'm the door of the sheepfold. How can we live fully for God? Here's a great question for you. Can you answer that question? How can you live fully for God? How can you catch fire, so to speak? How can you get switched on, tuned in? I read some helpful words. The people gave the willing hearts when they were building the tabernacle or the tent of worship in the wilderness that God had shown Moses the pattern how to build it and the people were so generous Moses had to say stop giving stop giving because what a wonderful problem to have they stopped the people from bringing anything more oh that we would have such generous hearts that we'd be ready to give that we'd be ready to share, that we'd be ready to bless, to become excited about God. You know what you need to do? You need to stay around people who are excited about the things of God. We used to have a coal fire when I was a little boy, and sometimes a piece of coal, red hot coal, would fall out of the fire onto the fireplace. And soon the flame would go out, the glow would disappear and it was became just a piece of cold dead coal but if you mix the coals together with burning coals they'll stay 
on fire. So go with people of vision and you'll catch the vision. Hang out with grumblers and you become a grumbler. Hang out with complainers and you become a complainer. You'll soon catch a hardening of the attitudes, not a hardening of the arteries, but a hardening of the attitudes. So here we have a rich and wonderful book. Outlines are good. It's great to study the details, but you know, there's no substitute for reading the word of God itself. Keep that in mind. So I want to encourage you. Keep on reading the word of God. Read the book of Exodus. I keep telling people I've been reading 30 minutes each morning. First thing when I wake up, I feel the priority is to spend time with God. I call it my 30 minute rule. So I started in Genesis and now I'm going right through nearly into the New Testament. And I just read 30 minutes and then underline so I know where I'm up to. And I, every day, honestly, I'm telling you the truth, every day I feel God says to me something through the word to encourage me, to challenge me, to make me want to do better, be better, be purer. Oh, what a privilege it is to serve God. What a privilege it is. May the Lord richly bless you today. Until next time, God bless you.